So a couple things, a couple things. Do you guys wanna share who you are and what you do? I am Donnie Williams, I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Horizon Media. Um, that effectively means that uh, the digital services that we offer to clients on a daily basis roll up to me, I'm responsible for those. I have better days and worse days in that job. <laughs> Um, but please, share a little bit about you guys. Hi, I'm Dina Marovich. I'm the SVP of Media and Interactive Marketing for Paramount Home Media, which is basically home entertainment. Um, that encompasses digital downloads, uh, Blu-ray and DVD, and video on demand products. So basically anything that leaves the theaters comes to my team and we market those. Okay. I'm Melissa Shanky from Target. I'm the Director of Media Strategy, which basically means we pull together the right mix of all of our different channels and guest connection points to come up with the right solutions to deliver on our guests' needs and our marketing objectives. Um, so whether that's pulling together email, search, PR, or TV, how do we look at those solutions together um, and also lead a video strategy team as part of that group? I'm Greg Ehrlich. I work at Clorox uh, doing uh, I'm the creative lead, social media lead, and the executive producer, which basically means I make a bunch of content for a bunch of CPG brands, a lot of the content being video. Cool. Welcome, guys, and thanks Thank for joining. Yeah. Thank um, you. So slight, slight uh, change of plans here. What I was thinking, it's pretty creative. What I was thinking is that I would uh, see if there were any questions you guys want to kick up to us before we get started. See, oftentimes you get questions after you talk for a bit, but this is going to be before. Does anyone have anything burning that they want to uh, they want to ask this talented crew up here or myself? Anything? Quick question. I told many of you guys to ask questions, so I'm disappointed, or I will be disappointed if none of you ask any questions. Or I'm going to have to start asking questions. No questions so far. Good. Okay. If you have any, please feel free to uh, feel free to to join in. So a couple things. So uh, first. Um, I've learned a handful of, of things in the past day and a half or so. I learned um, that, I, that I feel like are applicable to my daily life at Horizon Media. I learned one that content creation, we're gonna circle back and define it, but content creation um, offers a successful avenue for engaging prospective clients or customers. Um, I've learned that Blake Griffin's talent extends well beyond basketball. Um, that is crazy campaign execution. I've learned that a significant percentage of the, of the current video assets that are being deployed by marketers are commercial assets uh, distributed mm -hmm. across uh, digital environments. Um, I've also learned that there is a tremendous amount of enthusiasm uh, from at least the marketer world, and I think on the agency side as well, and certainly lots of the tech providers here, to continue to develop content um, meaning, and we saw some stat yesterday, I think, it was like 70% of marketers intend to invest more in uh, content creation over the coming year. Have you, got, have you guys picked up on other bits and pieces that you think are valuable, insightful, things that you can turn around and leverage for your own? Well, I learned Bacar is a really nice place to be, so that's the first thing I've learned. Um, first time here, and I love it. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've learned over the past day and a half or two days has been really validating for me because I struggle with all these things. You know, I read in the press, so oh, programmatic's coming, what are you doing about it? And, you know, content versus advertising, and how much are you spending on your creative versus your advertising, and all these things that are swirling around in my head, and I know a lot of you all, especially the agencies and the marketers, um, deal with the same things I deal with every day. So it's good to kind of put it into perspective and to see how, you know, other brands are handling that and um, there were a few things that I could definitely take back and it's also good to see just the proliferation of new vendors that are coming out as the marketplace changes and um, you know as media consumption habits are you know going across multiple devices um, it's kind of interesting to see all the ad offerings out there that are available to consumers and how that's kind of catching up with consumer media habits. I would say having been here a year ago I'm excited to see how far the conversation has come it was very much about what type of measurement should we be exchanging, buying, and selling on, and how do we get together to try to evolve those definitions and try to push the marketplace. And I feel like we're now in a position where there's a lot of conversations around content and how do we let the creative product that's actually inspiring all of our customers to catch up with the automation that's coming through media, and we're getting a better handle on how to use our data to be able to do that. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I think, 
I, I would actually say this as a plug for videonomics. I think in the past three, four, five years, whatever it's been, it's gotten more focused on stuff that I care about. And I think this year, more talk about content and the, the role of content versus just the um, tracking and, and the ad sales side. I also, um, <clears throat> I was sort of gratified to hear uh, that Target has sort of the same struggles that we have because it sort of, it just validates that the landscape is kind of the same. Everyone wants better than UGC, but not $300,000 production kind of content. And how do you find that and create it quickly and all this stuff? I think a lot of people have the same issues, so that's kind of good to hear. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's been validating. And I think um, <clears throat> I also always, every year, discover some random new technology. This year, I found someone that I'm going to try and track Hook down. Up with. Cool. Hey, do, while you're uh, chatting, but do you want to just define for us, we spoke earlier and at length about the definition of content and how everyone's kind of using it in a slightly different manner? Do you want to sure. just frame the dialogue? I mean, I, I think it's probably more my preoccupation than most of the people here. But I, as being interested in content, I think it's one of those words which this is the moment when everyone's saying the word content and people nod their heads, not necessarily thinking that the same thing is being discussed. So even going around a table where I might be sitting where someone is creating content off Paramount Pictures or Hulu where they're using TV shows or movies versus content that's you know, social media content where they made a special program for Instagram or Twitter or whatever it is. Um, so I think content gets used a lot of different ways and kind of has come to mean anything that gets shown to anybody at any time is kind of the broad definition. I like to draw the distinction between content and advertising, even though I think Red Bull got brought up earlier this morning. Like Red Bull, to me, sits squarely in the middle between content and advertising in that when you see a guy on a mountain bike jump off a cliff with a GoPro strapped to his head, what is that? Is that advertising for something? <laughs> you know, and I think there's a lot of examples like that. The Chipotle Farmed and Dangerous is kind of branded content, advertising. I don't know what that is. Yeah. And I think there's a half a dozen other examples that come to mind of weird hybrids that don't fit any neat box. Um, so I think it's just a moment when, I don't know, the walls are sort of falling away between what used to be the TV show and then the commercial break in the TV show. Now it's all sort of a jumble, and I think increasingly so. And I wondered when Nate was talking about the AOL stuff, what that is and how that works with um, getting people to buy stuff. Yeah. So you, you brought up GoPro, which I think is always like the, uh, I don't know if it's the, um, the standard, but the gold standard, but it's certainly uh, someone that we reference within these events and, and on a daily basis. Quite consistently, consistency, consistently. I would say about GoPro, and perhaps I'm a cynic. Um, there is no company that's in a better position to create and develop messaging for their customers. Is that a? Is it a, so? From a content strategy standpoint, is it a purely democratic world, or is it good for some, not uh, for all? I, I mean, I'll just give you one quick answer. GoPro is the bane of my existence in that every meeting starts with someone who's a client coming yeah. and saying. Why don't we get some go GoPros right. and strap them on the, blah, blah, blah. and <laughs> you know, so, and I just watched the Charlie Rose with the CEO of GoPro saying, you know, we've changed the way people are talking about and having experience in their lives. I personally think the democratization of typewriters didn't make for a million great novels, and cheap nice. camcorders didn't make for a million great movies, and a million GoPros, you know, it's great for kids breaking their elbows in their parking lots with their skateboards, but. Great content, it still requires the same steps of someone who's going to do something with it. So I love a good cheap camera that you can smash and not cry. Yep. But um, I, I, I think GoPro is a fascinating company, but I, don't, I think they've sort of been co-opted by Red Bull in a funny way. But I think um, they, uh, I don't care so much about the quality of GoPro as the putting it in the hands of a million people doesn't mean there's a million filmmakers out there. Fair. Um, Christy, do you mind if we shift gears? You want, you sure. want to add anything? Else? Christy yesterday said a couple things that I thought were was fascinating throughout the day. Um, one, congratulations on having her. She seems great. <laughs> yes. um, two, uh, she said, "Hey, Target's lifting a lot of the restrictions." I, you know, meaning I think what she meant was we're me we're trying to make it easier to go to market in a more um, a more authentic authentic manner. Um, but she also said, "Hey, we're suffering from." A gap as it relates to content, uh, and then a, you know sprinkling of other things as well. Mm -hmm. What so what what's really going on? I mean, you guys you guys clearly it's buy into right. You buy into the approach. Um, how do, how does it work internally? Who are the appropriate uh, stakeholders? Actually, the thing that she said that I thought was most fascinating, perhaps, was and it and I don't want to 
quote her verbatim, but she said, hey, Target sits at the core, right at the center as it relates to our content strategy. We'll, we'll effectively bring in our partners at the appropriate times. And I go, Gregor has got a different perspective on that. I'm sure, Dina, you do as well. But can you talk about what it takes to be an yeah. effective content marketer? I think at the end of the day, we know that that is the, the messaging and sort of the conversation we can have with our guest. And so trying to understand what is the right content and what is Target's role in delivering a message of any kind, whether it is a more traditional, traditional advertising approach where we have something that we believe is important and we want a lot of our guests to see that, where we might follow more of a traditional workflow and organizational structure. And then there are the things that are very, very responsive and very personalized that is important to our guests that we see an opportunity that we can you know, really take advantage of. And that's where the growth is coming from. That's where the challenges are coming from, is how do you balance organizationally, budgetary, um, moving forward into a place that is becoming a, a lot more organic and nimble, um, and with the ability to understand what our, our guest is looking for and what is important, and really be able to connect that back to performance. It's changing the landscape of the way we do media planning and the way we do content planning, where our creatives are no longer going through a very formal briefing process, and that's the only way they're delivered work. It's about sitting in the room with their brand marketer who knows their business and their category and kind of what we're willing to do. It's sitting with our social channel community owners to understand how do we leverage this platform in a way that makes the most sense. Um, and a strategist that can help connect the dots to other things and having those ongoing conversations around like what do we need to be creating and how are we constantly optimizing all of those connection points based on what's working and where we see new opportunities. Um, so it's, it's becoming much more of an organic structure. I would say the thing that holds us together that makes it work is having those core relationships kind of moving together. And whether you think of it as an amoeba or it's a, you know, a, a formal relationship, those relationships are what drives it forward. Um, so flexible, dynamic, everything needs to be everything needs to be refined on an ongoing basis in order to get out there rapidly. Absolutely, because then you have the right expertise of what works. Um, and building off of the conversation yesterday that we started to have around media and creative and sort of what should come first, and does the media plan lead the creative development or does the creative idea lead the media plan? You can't think about it that linearly anymore, and it's really going through the process together. Um, and trying to bring in insights and be open to insights throughout everything that we're talking about, whether it's how are we ready to create more real time or how are we being more intentional about what's going to go into the marketplace. That's great. Dina? Yeah. I think most folks, I'm going to ask a different question. I'm just going to keep go asking the questions. Yeah. Go for it. I feel like that's my role here. Um, <laughs> most, I think most folks think to themselves, wow, wouldn't it be terrific? to be an entertainment marketer <laughs> now, right? Because yeah. you guys sit on a you know, wealth of, of content, certainly. Um, what, are, you know, what are the pros and cons, limitations? How can partners that are sitting in this room uh, help you guys? Yeah. You know? So, well, first of all, our advertising is our content and vice versa, and it pretty much always has been. You know, we have a tremendous amount of assets that we could use, which is a, both a blessing and a curse because, you know, especially the theatrical team will take out some of the highlights and the trailers and so forth. And then now we have social media where you get almost immediate feedback on, you know, whether people are liking the film, or the, the trailer or not. And so it goes through this iteration in the, in the life of film and then it comes to our window, you know, a year later almost. And then we have to have that challenge of re-engaging people with the property or with the movie and, you know, learning what did well in the theatrical window and what didn't do so well. And you know, if the things that didn't do well, can we turn it around somehow? And so I think that a lot of times we get thrown a hot potato because sometimes movies don't really completely find their audience in the theaters and then they find them in the home entertainment window and then there's other titles that do gangbusters at the box office and never really convert well in the home entertainment window. So it's really up to us to find the most effective pieces of marketing and also to come up with a really smart cadence strategy of when you're going to release that content and how you're going to release it. And I think the how is super important for all advertisers, but especially for movie advertisers where you know you kind of have to work with a set amount of content that you already have created. Um, and then sometimes you may need to create more or different content where you're filling a void. Um, so, you know, sometimes, for example, if your audience is millennials, maybe there's something you could do with a, a game or an interactive experience that might augment your current content. So, 
Got it. And so you and you alluded to this strongly. Are you guys ready to jump into the data <coughs> portion of the discussion or the performance analytics? Sure. Um, you've alluded to it strongly. <coughs> it sounds like, and I think it would be, I think it would be helpful for people to understand this. Data is really at the centerpiece as it relates to how you guys make decisions, mm -hmm. both from an advertising standpoint, certainly from a business yeah. standpoint. And there was a lengthy conversation yesterday again around how available information today is really actionable, which which actually surprises me because I don't feel like I see that all the time, but can you talk about how data plays a role in your approach? Yeah, I mean, we definitely have reams of data, whether it be, you know, our TV spot testing, our social media insights, you know, tracking information, all that stuff. But the key is like you have, sometimes you have so much that you're like, well, what do we do with this? And sometimes the data is conflicting. And I think you just have to kind of find the one or two key pieces that you could expound upon, you know, for our window and, you know, create experiences for consumers that hopefully interest them again in the movie. So I think that the creative process sh comes in in the execution process for us. And I think the data is really about setting the strategy and setting the overall tone of the campaign. Um, and then I think the, you know, you asked me before on the phone, like how much of it is data and how much of it is gut. Yeah. And I think for movie advertisers, the gut always wants to come in. Um, but I think now that we have access to all this data, I think it's good because sometimes I think it's counterintuitive to what some people might think. So. Right. And Melissa, how anxious are you about going back to Minneapolis? <laughs> no, wrong. That's a different question. Okay. Totally different question. Um, <laughs> let's let's try this one. What yes. what? So again, Christy was talking about it yesterday. What what is the what information are you guys looking at that's helping to inform your approach? What is this? What what are all the, what are these available attribution laden yeah. data? I think it's points. a little bit of understanding who our guest is, and then as we dig deeper into the segments, it helps us understand where we should be going as well. Um, so even something like our YouTube strategy and trying to understand who is actually consuming our content and in what ways and what's useful for them is now leading into well, what should our strategy be for the next six months? Should we be making more of this type of content? Should we be making more of this? Is it more how-to videos? Is it more working with our vendors to bring in product demonstrations? Or is it really a bit more of the, the inspiring and kind of welcoming people into the season with new trends? Um, and it, we have those conversations platform by platform based on what we see is working. Um, and sometimes putting content into the marketplace and then really dissecting the audiences that are consuming it in that way. Right. Now is, so you guys, again, taking a position around content residing in-house, does that mean data is in-house also? Does that mean the resources that activate information are sitting in your side of the fence? We have a very heavy emphasis internally um, okay. in terms of kind of where the, where our data lives as well as where the strategies are in terms of how we're using it and, and driving that content. But we're absolutely looking at a network of partners and agencies that help us bring that to life and bring in deeper layers of not only the insight side of it, but truly the activation as well. And it becomes a much more holistic partnership as we work through that together. Cool. Gregor? Oh, I was just thinking of, I was, saw this guy interviewed who was the head of CERN, and they said, a press conference, why did you build CERN Reactor? And he was like, I have two answers. One, what I tell everyone when they ask me that in the press, and the other, which is the truth. And I was thinking <laughs> that the answers that I could give you. One, the answer that we tell everyone internally is of course data is we all live and die by data and we have our KPIs and we all have to hit them and all that. And then there's kind of the truth answer, which isn't so different, but it's, it, it feels like a lie when you give a very complicated answer to a straightforward question. So when someone says, what is success with this thing? And you have to hem and haw and talk for a half an hour, it feels like you're not telling the truth. Right. Because the truth is, you know, we're just trying to sell more stuff, whatever it is. But sometimes we're trying to do that by increasing consumer affinity and likeliness to recommend in the trailing 16 months after exposure to, and we don't have the kind of, we call them BDAs internally, but the marketing mix models, whatever. In general, on a little campaign, we don't have the kind of marketing mix models that are even built to capture this data because right. it's like too small a signal too far off. I believe that it does work and we have measured it on some bigger campaigns, but a lot of it is kind of faith-based um, marketing in that we, we think and what we know is true and we proceed based on that. Right. We, we do have some empirical data to support it and we have done to justify when we're asking for a budget to get ROI numbers, but those are often conflated by the fact that usually content doesn't exist in the absence of advertising. So usually it's rolled up into a bigger thing. We're trying to isolate markets and trying to you know, do incredibly complicated regression analysis to show that what we did was actually uh, effective and worked. And it's, um, 
it's complicated, I think, is the true answer. Right. Yes. That's fascinating. Uh, guys, we're, I'm gonna burn through all 30 minutes very quickly, so if there are any questions, seriously, fire them out now, because we're, we're running short on time. Just raise hands if you want. Is that cool? Questions? No questions? Nice. You guys are so sluggish. <laughs> There's those giant cookies. Pick it up after lunch. Yeah. Right. Uh, I have a resource question for the brands, uh, both as relates to internal and external resources. So in this world where things are really blurred between content and advertising, is there a skill set or a type of person your organizations are missing or you're struggling to fill? And is there some unmet need within um, your own organizations? And then when you look at your agency partners, are they also right sourced for what you need in this blurred space? Um, and if not, is there room for a new type of agency to, to fit this role? You want me to take the agency piece first, or you guys want to go on? I was or just going to offer you an observation. A lot of agencies yeah. I talk to lately tell me about the shape of their tables. They, that's like their first phone call when they call up. They say, we have a big round table with a strategy guy sitting next to a data guy sitting next to a creative guy. Totally. And, I, and that conversation has happened a half a dozen times. And I think that is the answer to, to me, is that what we need in this new blended family world is a blended agency where it's not like the strategy is separate. We need people to sit together and work together. Because that's the whole is not one thing. It's a guy or several people who can do this all together. Yeah, I would agree. I, I will say, and I'll, I'll take um, just kind of a, a slightly different path. I think it's really hard for organizations like ours to identify talent that delivers on the ambition of a brand consistently. And what I mean by that is um, you, typically those people have other ambitions, right, that are not related to brand marketing. Like I, we've, most of the creative folks that we uh, look at for ideation and new media solutions, new services, content brand opportunities, they can get frustrated just by, um, you know, the natural course of conversations and or the friction associated with strategy and activation and channel insights and consumer insights and all that different stuff. And, that's, and I think we, as an organization who's very successful, growing rapidly, need to figure out how to create an environment where those people can breathe and grow and actually do great work. Yeah, I would say that those that are the most successful have been those that come with very strong external interests that can keep a pulse on what is happening in the landscape with the consumer, with the brand, and with technology, are willing to go deep enough into the analytics and the data to find things that might have been missed um, by a team that's only looking at the data all the time and help to translate that into their creative and content partners. Um, and it, it really helps kind of bring it all to life to make it feel more real and more actionable. And at the end of the day, it helps define the purpose, which is why we're creating this content and trying to get it out in the first place. Cool. I would just say you have to be either really right-brained, really left-brained, or a really great combination of both. And I think there's a need for all three of those people, just depending on what the, you know, what the discipline is. Right. Mm -hmm. So outside of these walls, and I'm sure in certain breakout sessions that I didn't participate in, there's this incredibly kind of urgent dialogue around programmatic, quote unquote. It feels like programmatic doesn't exist when we're sitting up here and talking about the new, you know, the, the new approach to a potential customer or consumer. What, so what is the truth about programmatic and what, where does it fit? I mean, are we talking about, it's, and again, I feel like huge opportunities, especially in delivering a, an agency service uh, in the future, because hey, the, there are certain processes that are too manual. Let's automate them and let's focus on creative, uh, creative work. Mm -hmm. But what do you? What's the belief around programmatic? Mm -hmm. And let's try not to. I mean, I know it's, it's an, it's a lot large. I was term. looking at the shot clock, thinking <laughs> we just run out the clock yeah, and right, answer. Right. <clears throat> Quick thoughts on programmatic, and and let's frame it within what percentage of your budget will be programmatic next year, if you can. Um, right now, for us, programmatics in its very early stages, uh, we're trying to find the best use of it in our media plans. Uh, right now, we're looking at 
mostly driving digital download transactions using programmatic video or programmatic advertising. Um, we're testing, you know, different partners and things like that. Um, I think for movie advertisers, programmatic is going to be more of a slower adoption than maybe a lot of other advertisers categories because, you know, those 360 brand integrations that we do are, aren't going to go away anytime soon. Um, you know, the sponsorships and, and the big splashy ad units and, you know, the TV and the online promotion and the sweepstakes and things like that, I think are here to stay and there'll be, a, you know, a good portion of the plans moving forward, at least in the near future. And if programmatic is truly about automation, we have a heavy investment in programmatic from a digital standpoint with an appetite to do more so that we can put our time and energy into other things. Um, also in -house. So looking to accelerate that. Um, it's going to come through partnerships for sure, but right now it's being driven a lot internally. Um, and then with our core media partners, I think as we get to a place where it will be more all-inclusive with other channels, it'll continue to stretch farther and farther to not only the, the media sellers, but also our agency's role within that. Very cool. I think programmatic is like saying digital, like if someone says you work in marketing, I don't think you have to say I work in digital marketing anymore. I think all marketing is digital and all marketing yep. effectively is programmatic. Like, whether you see the ad on BuzzFeed or New York Times or the middle of your Hulu movie or whatever, we're going to hunt you down where you live and stuff content down your throat no matter where you are. And I think <laughs> that to me is sort of the definition of programmatic at its most effective, which is give you what you need to know when you need to know it before you buy your $100,000 luxury car in your zip code where you're going to do it. Whatever it is, we're going to know and do a better job of delivering you, not give you dog food messages when you're a cat owner, you know. Right. Lots of data. I think that's it for us. We're, uh, the clock is going the wrong direction at this point. Um, thank you guys very much. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, team. Thank you, guys. Thank that's you. Great.